I'm now going to spend the next many videos discussing multiprocess, okay? And it's always been important, you know, how you design these multiprocess because for several decades, people have been taking multiple different process chips, putting them on a motherboard, uh, connecting multiple different machines on a rack and so on. These topics have become even more important in the last five or six years because we now have multiprocess on a single chip, right? So because of multi-core technology, a single chip has multiple cores on it. Each chip has its own private caches. There is a detailed memory hierarchy, and you know, hence you have multiple copies of the same piece of data. And so it becomes very important, you know, how uh, these different copies of data are kept consistent. It is also important, you know, how we design programming models and what architectural support is provided to these programming models to make it easier to exploit all of these many cores. Right? We do want to write applications which can be partitioned into many threads and that can exploit all of these many um, these many processing capabilities on a single chip. Okay, so in this first couple of videos I'll just focus on taxonomy and programming models and then after that I'll dive into issues such as cache coherence. Okay, so the first thing we need to look at is you know how exactly is memory being organized, how exactly are codes being organized uh, and this impacts the kind of cache coherence mechanism that you ultimately implement. Okay, so the first organization we look at is something called uh, the symmetric shared memory multiprocessor organization. What it leads to is uniform memory access, and I'll soon explain you know how um, how this comes about. Okay, so uh, it's best to do it with with an example figure over here. Okay, so I have a processor, I have some private caches associated with that processor. Okay, and then after that, I have my final main memory, which is a centralized unit. Okay, and it is reachable through this one single access point in this case. And you know, all of these caches and this memory access point are all connected with a shared bus. So everybody has a symmetric and uniform view of the main memory system, right? So everybody, you know, from the perspective of any given processor or cache, you're essentially looking at this bus, and the main memory system is reachable through this bus and everyone incurs kind of the same penalty to reach that main memory. Okay, and you know, this is why I said that this has uniform memory access because everyone, you know, could spend 300 cycles getting the next piece of data from memory and it is symmetric because, you know, everyone has exactly the same identical view of the main memory system. Okay, so there are clearly some problems that you might see with this approach. You know, there is a centralized unit, there is a bus that is being shared by everybody and so, you know, having these centralized and shared resources leads to a possible bottleneck, okay? And because of this, it's not possible for us to arbitrarily increase the number of processes, right? So if you have, say, you know, eight processes or if you have, you know, 16 processes, maybe that is manageable. You know, maybe they have a miss, you know, once every 16 cycles, which means the bus will never be oversubscribed. But once you start having, you know, 64 processes or 128 processes, it is very likely that there will be multiple requests that, that try to access the bus and the main memory system in any given cycle. And so then the queuing delays start to increase. Okay, so you know having a bus and having a centralized view of memory, while it might make the implementation simple, is, is perhaps not very scalable, uh, at least not beyond say 16 different processes and caches. Okay, so next let's look at the other alternative view, which is considered to be uh, the more scalable alternative and it is called the distributed memory multiprocessor. Okay, so again let's look at a figure and see how this is organized. So again I have my processor and I have my caches. You know, the caches are private to that processor. And then, you know, so previously I had this this processor and cache and you know there were many of these hooked up to a single shared bus and the main memory was sitting as one monolithic unit on the other side of this bus. Now what I'm doing is I'm taking this main memory and I'm splitting it up into multiple pieces and one of these pieces is is associated directly with this processor in memory. Okay, so you have the processor in the cache, connected to that is a portion of my entire memory. Okay, and there might be some other I.O. units over here like a disk and so on. And you know each of these is pretty much a self-contained processor node, right? This could be you know one single server or one single blade on a rack. Okay, so it's a self-contained computer and then all of these are now being connected through some scalable network. Okay, so this could be a mesh network. Okay, so you know this is my self-contained processor over here and you know this could be connected to a neighboring processor and then a neighboring processor 
and these could be connected to form a grid or a mesh network okay and this can continue okay so there are several nodes you know maybe 64 256 nodes and they all talk to each other through the scalable network and when I say it is scalable, what I mean is it's not a bus. It's not something where I'm broadcasting a signal that has to be seen by everybody. Okay, so if I want a if I want a message to be sent from A to B, that has to be sent you know through multiple hops on this network from A to B, and not everyone sees it. Okay, it's only the intermediate routers that get to see it. Okay, and you know because this is not a broadcast because there is no single centralized resource this is considered to be scalable that is I can grow this from 64 to 256 without really impacting the behavior of the first 64 by too much right so you know this grid network can continue to grow as much as it wants and you know traffic from A to B in that case would not be affected by the fact that I've added more nodes over here to the left right so uh, that's what I mean by a scalable interconnection network okay now let's let's get back to the memory part of it okay so as I said before you know what is mostly being done in this case is you know one I'm replacing the bus with a scalable network okay and the main memory is being partitioned into these many slices and there's one slice being associated with each processor and cache okay so every processor has access has low latency access to a small fraction of memory okay and all of this other memory is also visible to that processor okay so based on the address I issue the memory will either be serviced locally at low latency or to get memory from here then I have to send a request over the network it may be say you know three hops to get here then I access that memory and then the data gets sent back again traversing three different hops and coming back to the processor okay so there's this notion of local memory and remote memory which is why this is no longer uniform memory access this is non-uniform memory access where every processor is going to have you know low latency access to some memory and higher latency access to others based on how many network hops have to be traversed okay and this is also a distributed memory model because the memory that was you know centralized over here has now been scattered across many different nodes okay so this is generally considered to be uh, the more scalable model this is a model where I can have you know 256 different processors all together working on a single application or problem okay but it also perhaps leads to slightly higher implementation costs okay and uh, you know that is that is stuff that we will tease out in the next many videos okay so uh, as I said this is the distributed memory model it has non-uniform memory access okay so you know both of these figures were kind of drawn you know 15 20 years ago if, even earlier than that perhaps where you know all you had on one node was a processor and its cache a single processor and a single cache okay all of these models have also kind of migrated onto a chip okay so instead of viewing this as off-chip main memory you could also view this as your last level cache okay so let me just kind of redraw this figure um, so here's one single processor chip okay and here I have my processor core then I have a private L1 okay I have a private L2 so L1 private L2 right and likewise there are many different cores over here with L1 L2 and so on okay and then maybe I implement a really large shared L3 the last level cache okay and access to this is through one central point over here okay and so what you could do is implement a bus which connects which which is connected to all of these other uh, L2s as well so when you have a miss in the L2 you send a broadcast over here it is seen by all of these other caches and it is also seen by the shared L3 okay and you'll see that this figure is exactly like this figure that I drew over here okay but when I initially explained this figure and when people initially you know drew up this model all of this was essentially one chip okay and likewise all of this was one chip and so on right and what you were doing is accessing your main memory okay but a cache coherence protocol that I designed for this for example could also very well apply to a single chip model which has many cores many private caches and then a shared last level L3 cache okay and the same thing exists over here as well right so again let me clear out this figure and you'll recall this one chip that I drew earlier which was our tiled uh, which, which was our tiled multi-core processor but I said that you know on one tile what you have is a core you have your private L1 you have a portion of your large L2 or a large L3 right so you have your private caches and then you have a slice of a shared cache okay and then you have many of these tiles and they're connected with a grid network right so I had drawn exactly this model before and I said that what you really have is a shared L3 
but I've broken it up into many different slices and there's a small slice associated with each core okay so if you have missed that service by your local size then you have very low latency access to the L3 but if your data happens to be sitting over here then yes you can also get that data right so you have to send a request that goes on the network and then you access the data here and get sent back so you have non-uniform access before I called it NUCA because it was non-uniform cache access okay and you know similarly you know this model ex looks exactly like the one I've drawn over here where instead of you know having your local memory what I'm saying is you have your you know local L3 slice over here okay and again you have to keep things coherent right all of these private caches maybe have copies of data they have to all be kept coherent and your shared L3 is a common spot for you to kind of get your data from just as the memory was a common spot for you to get data from okay so as I go through my explanations of cache coherence I will refer to these models but you know keep in mind that these models can be applied in multiple different scenarios right the entire model could be placed on a single chip as is being done over here so you know, this is a one chip multiprocessor and you can also imagine the case where there are you know where this is one single processor chip this is one entire blade in a rack for example which has its own processor it has its own you know local DRAM main memory right and so you know this these these computation models can all be placed within a single chip or they could be placed uh, across an entire rack okay so having gone through this basic terminology I will in the next video introduce the concept of uh, the two most most popular programming models shared memory and message passing